Item number, SCP-036. Object class, safe. Special containment procedures. Once every year, a mobile task force is dispatched from Containment Command 02 and data expunged to Site 22A to defend the runway and airport located there. The civilian facility is to be cleared of all non-SCP personnel by 0400 hours of September 23rd and none are allowed to return until sunrise the next day. On October 1st, all civilians must be evacuated again before sunrise and will not be allowed on to Site 22A until the return of the pilgrimage flight. Pilgrims in transit from the arrival flight awaiting departure on the pilgrim flight may only be cross-examined by researchers with level 3 security level clearance or higher. Description SCP-036 includes the location Site 22A, a small airport in the Mosul region of northern Iraq, and Site 22B, the destination of passengers boarding at Site 22A. The key components of SCP-036 are the arrival flight, a passenger plane that varies in make and model from year to year that arrives shortly before dawn on September 23rd. It appears on radar about 30 to 40 kilometers away from Site 22A. When it lands, pilgrims exit the plane and enter the terminal. No crew have ever left the plane. Observations have only revealed a masked pilot and co-pilot. This plane leaves quickly after pilgrims exit. It does not wait for clearance for takeoff, nor does it identify itself upon approaching for landing. The Pilgrims People of the Yazidi faith that exit the arrival plane, who are said to be undergoing the Kiras Gurahin. Each year, they are examined and identified as various people of the Yazidi faith that have died during the previous year. This is done through birth certificates, photo IDs, specific knowledge questions, and when possible, fingerprinting. Most have been known to be friendly and amicable, though most are reluctant to give details about the Kiras Gurahin. In the past, all have shown to be unable to recognize family and friends, or been able to remember any information beyond what short-term memory would normally allow. In the late afternoon of September 23rd, most pilgrims begin to emphasize how important it is that their pilgrimage must begin. At that time, they file onto the pilgrimage flight plane and depart, never to be seen again. The Pilgrimage Flight A passenger plane provided by SCP personnel for the transport of the pilgrims. It is manned by a crew of trained Yazidi holy men. The crew are typically never able to elaborate upon details of the pilgrimage, or what the Kiras Gurahin actually is. SCP equipment on board function optimally, but recorded data will only slightly increase our understanding of the pilgrimage each year. Though the flight is gone for seven days, the crew and recorded data are only able to account for a few hours. Days are missing from time recording equipment and cameras, though nothing abnormal is ever observed. The plane disappears from radar and visual contact is lost about 50 to 60 kilometers away from Site 22A until it returns about sunrise on October 1st. Site 22B The destination of the pilgrimage plane. It is a small airport consisting of a runway and single building located at coordinates data expunged. It has only ever been observed by pilgrimage crew and cameras on the plane. It does not appear on satellite images and attempts to reach it on foot have failed, once with disastrous results. Cameras have trouble focusing on the area, as the heat from the ground usually causes a mirage-like visual effect on all objects more than a few dozen meters from the plane. A flyover with an SCP reconnaissance plane several weeks before the pilgrimage revealed undeveloped land and what looked like an ancient stone statue. In the 1990s, SCP Mobile Task Force Sigma-4 attempted to reach Site-22B during the time of the pilgrimage. Upon the approach, communication was lost and the task force was never heard from again. No other exploration attempts are advised during the seven-day pilgrimage. Originally, the Kurdish-speaking Yazidi people around Mosul secretly performed the pilgrimage themselves. Pilgrims from the east were escorted by masked armed guards on camel back into the care of Yazidi holy men. It has been explained that the holy men would then take the pilgrims west to their land of the dead, where the pilgrims would wait to be reborn back into the Yazidi people. The Kiras Gurahin, literally Kurdish for changing garments, is used to describe the belief of reincarnation that lesser souls of the Yazidi undergo. 
While this actual pilgrimage was done in secret, a symbolic pilgrimage and Kiras Gurahin are performed every year at this time by other Yazidi. During the 1960s, land acquisition by Kurds and Muslims, attacks by Turks, and punitive laws by the Islamic Iraqi government restricted the movements and customs of the Yazidi. During that time, the Foundation stepped in and offered aid in the way of an advantageous clause that granted SCP planes unrestricted access to airport facilities in the area. Almost immediately, mysterious planes carrying pilgrims from the east began landing at the local airport, and an elusive airport at the destination appeared as well. Item Number SCP-089 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-089 is stored in a special shipping container at Site-36 and monitored for locution events. Mobile Task Force Mu-89, consisting of personnel with advanced training in linguistics, psychology, and tactical diplomacy, has been deployed in order to respond to such events. Upon the occurrence of a locution event, Mobile Task Force Mu-89 is to translate and interpret the locution so as to identify the primary subjects of that triggering herein designated as SCP-089-A and SCP-089-B, then execute Protocol M8, which consists of the following steps. 1. Transport SCP-089 to SCP-089-A's location and explain Protocol M8 to SCP-089-B, and 2. At such time as SCP-089-B is prepared to voluntarily execute Protocol M8, Render to SCP-089-B any assistance as SCP-089-B may request in connection with SCP-089-B performing the following actions. Inserting SCP-089-A into the cavity together with inflammable materials, such as oiled wood or charcoal, then igniting them. The successful execution of Protocol M8 requires the voluntary compliance of SCP-089-B in a sober and uncoerced state. Likewise. SCP-089-A must be conscious and alert during the execution of the protocol. It is recommended that SCP-089-B be restrained, although not sedated, following ignition, so as to avoid interference with the completion of the protocol, as the process is extremely painful and fatal to SCP-089-A. If SCP-089-B refuses to voluntarily execute Protocol M8 in accordance with the aforementioned specifications, MTF Mu-89 is to explain the prospective consequences of failing to successfully complete the protocol and make every effort to persuade SCP-089-B to cooperate. If MTF Mu-89's best efforts to persuade SCP-089-B are unsuccessful, SCP-089 is to be redesignated as Keter class, and Protocol M9 is to be executed. The use of intimidation, threats, or mind-altering drugs or intoxicants in an effort to affect SCP-089-B's free will, and any attempt to complete Protocol M8 without SCP-089-B's participation or voluntary cooperation, or otherwise other than as described, are strictly prohibited since these measures invalidate the attempted completion of the protocol and are known to intensify the severity of the attendant Type S event. It is also recommended, although not a required part of Protocol M8, to cause the execution of Step 2 of Protocol M8 to be accompanied by the sounding of horns and percussion instruments, as doing so may mask the sounds by SCP-089-A during the execution of the protocol. Upon a successful execution of Protocol M8, the related Type S event generally begins to abate within seven hours. Description SCP-089 is a glazed earthenware statue, approximately three meters in height, depicting a winged, bull-headed humanoid with an open mouth. The front of the statue's torso is hinged and can be opened from the top to reveal a cavity, approximately 0.6 cubic meters in volume, and can be locked from the outside. The rear of the statue bears an inscription in a Canaanite language, possibly Punic. Dr. translated an excerpt of the text as Nightmare of Moloch, Moloch the Loveless, Mental Moloch, Moloch the Heavy Judger of Men. The statue dates from approximately the 2nd century BCE. On infrequent occasions, sometimes separated by periods in excess of a century, the statue speaks. The mechanism by which these sounds are made is not understood, and the mouth of the statue does not move. The statue's locutions are in a Canaanite language, 
probably the same language as the inscription, and consist of the name or description of SCP-089-A, a demand for Protocol M8 to be accomplished, together with instructions for doing so, and a description of the attendant Type S event in figurative language. Each locution event is followed within a period of 3 to 11 days by the commencement of a Type S event, meeting the description given in the locution event, unless Protocol M8 has already been completed. Each Type S event is an epidemic, natural disaster, mass hysteria involving genocide or other massacres, or other event involving extensive damage to property and loss of human lives over a period of time that continues until Protocol M8 is successfully completed. In the case of each documented locution event, the attendant Type S event, while significant, is limited to a geographic area that does not directly affect SCP-089-B. This has, in some documented cases, resulted in the pendency of a Type S event for an extended duration of time due to SCP-089-B's unawareness of SCP-089 or of Protocol M8 or to SCP-089-B's unwillingness to undertake Protocol M8 in order to arrest the Type S event. For each locution event, SCP-089-A is a healthy, unblemished human infant or child between 8 months and 6 years of age, and SCP-089-B is that child's natural mother. In all documented cases, at the time of the locution event, SCP-089-A and B are each alive and healthy and experience a strong bond of trust and affection with each other. Following SCP-089-B's placement of SCP-089-A in the cavity and the ignition of the inflammable materials, SCP-089-A will burn and be destroyed over a period of two to five hours. Addendum 1. Memo to file from Dr. Garcia. While the role of SCP-089 in actually causing Type S events is unclear, Experience has demonstrated that the prompt and precise application of Protocol M8 is effective in limiting the damage that they do. Dr. Patel has speculated that SCP-089 does not cause Type S events, but merely anticipates them and provides a means to mitigate their effects. Addendum 2 A partial list of documented Type S events that were terminated by means of Protocol M8, including of documented completions of Protocol M8 that predate the Foundation's acquisition of custody, of SCP-089 follows. Date of locution, March 21st, 1788. Description of Type S event and locution event. The flames shall consume their houses, yea, and their markets, and their temples, and all of their dwelling places. They shall be destroyed. Type S event, fire in city of Outcome. Protocol M8 completed on day 29 after locution event. 66% of city's buildings destroyed. Date of locution, December 2nd, 1850. Description of Type S event in locution event. The false prophet shall gather the multitude unto him and cast them against the princes. They shall each of them be slain and their fields made barren. Type S event. Large-scale messianic-based peasant uprising in an undisclosed location. Outcome. Protocol M8 completed on day 1363 after locution event. Massacres associated with uprising and its suppression and attendant agricultural collapse account for several million casualties. Date of locution. November 23, 1951. Description of Type S event and locution event. The earth shall tremble and the seas shall rise and be cast against the earth, and the mountain shall vomit fire. Its voice shall be darkness and death. Type S event, earthquake and volcanic eruption in an undisclosed location. Outcome, protocol M8 executed within 31 hours of locution event. No tsunami resulted, although geological models had anticipated that one would occur from a seismic event in that area. No fatalities. Date of locution, November 7th, 1970. Description of Type S event and locution event. The rains shall scour the earth and sweep away man and his beasts and all his works. The deluge shall take them all. Type S event, cyclone in an undisclosed location. Outcome, protocol M8 executed on day 49 after locution event. Casualties from flooding, disease, 
and starvation, estimated several thousand. Date of locution, April 4th, 2000. Description of Type S event and locution event, data expunged. Type S event, data expunged. Outcome, ongoing. Protocol M8 not yet executed. Welcome to SCP Orientation. Your training is about to begin. Today, we will be studying item number SCP-166. Object Class, Euclid. Special Containment Procedures. SCP-166 is contained in Biocontainment Zone C at Site-19, which has been modified to include a hermetically sealed antechamber and an industrial strength air purifier. Containment staff must wear the specially designated 166 biohazard suits at all times when inside SCP-166's containment area. Due to SCP-166's unique physiological needs, a variety of loose-fitting organic cotton clothing has been provided to be rotated monthly. All meals are to be cooked according to the guidelines provided, with as little inorganic additives as possible. Reasonable requests for personal items and modifications to the containment suite may be granted upon approval by a level 4 or higher authority. Update: All requests by SCP-166 must be approved personally by Site Director Light. To date, SCP-166 has requested a copy of the Holy Bible, Douay Rheims, Chaloner Revision, granted. A Catholic Rosary, granted. Access to a Catholic priest for confession, mass, and other sacraments. Chaplain Davis has been scheduled to meet with SCP-166 on alternating Sundays, after a thorough decontamination process. Various books and magazines, mostly religious in nature. Granted, pending review and approval of contents. A telephone, with which to contact the Abbess of the Our Lady of Mercy Convent in County Galway, Ireland. Denied by Site Director. Description SCP-166 is a European female human in its late teens with ungulate features, possessing antlers, hooved feet, and a short tail reminiscent of Rangifer Tarandus, common reindeer. Despite these obvious abnormalities, DNA analysis reveals no abnormal genetic traits. Within a 15-meter radius of SCP-166, Artificial objects gradually return to an unworked state. Higher complexity objects like electronics or vehicles are affected quicker, with degradation of their metallic components causing catastrophic structural failure in a matter of hours. Rudimentary materials, such as stone buildings or products made of organic materials, decay at a virtually imperceptible rate. Within the same radius, plant life will begin to sprout, often growing in improbable places such as out of security cameras or ID scanners. SCP-166 possesses a possibly anomalous sensitivity to artificial material and pollutants, with inhalation or contact causing pressure ulcers and symptoms of acute asthma attacks. In one case, physical proximity to a smoker caused SCP-166 to undergo a severe asthma attack, even though the doctor at the time had not smoked a cigarette for three weeks. Discovery SCP-166 was discovered at the Our Lady of Mercy convent in County Galway, Ireland, where it had lived since infancy. SCP-166 was confirmed by a defecting Global Occult Coalition agent to be the child of Threat Entity 9927 Black, the Goddess, also known as SCP- who was terminated by a GOC strike team in what would be known as the Cornwall Incident. Recovered GOC Documentation Threat ID KTE-9927-Blackchild The Daughter Authorized Response Level 4. Severe Threat Description Threat Entity is the child of incarnated LTE-9927-Black, the Goddess, and an unknown father. While it strongly resembles its mother and shares its animalistic features, it lacks the extreme bestial appearance of 9927 Black.
possesses minor chlorokinetic abilities, but primary reason for threat entity classification is the instinctive knowledge and eligibility to enact occult procedure clockwork Black Child Havala, a worldwide ritual working that would irreversibly regress human civilization to Neolithic standards. Strike Team Lancelot neutralized 9927 Black in 19 in England during an operation which would later be known as the infamous Cornwall Incident, but were unable to confirm the liquidation of 9927 Black Child due to the death of the strike leader, Agent Ukulele. Ukulele was posthumously awarded the Silver Aegis for his lifelong service to humanity. Liquidation Threat Entity is not known to possess any defensive abilities. Terminate with extreme prejudice. The agent had refused to terminate SCP-166, instead smuggling it to a Catholic convent in County Galway, Ireland. It lived there until the age of 12, at which point, a visitor to the convent accidentally witnessed SCP-166 and reported it to authorities. The agent then contacted the Foundation, agreeing to share GOC intelligence in return for the guaranteed safety and containment of SCP-166. Further details are classified. Addendum 166.1 Chaplain Davis Bi-Weekly Interview Davis Good morning, child. SCP-166 Good morning, father. Davis As usual, I have to remind you that due to our environment, the seal of confession will not take place unless specifically invoked. Even then, details of our conversation can be unsealed if they're determined to be essential. Understand? SCP-166 nods. Davis. Excellent. Now, how are you doing? SCP-166. Good. One of the staff told me about Benedict yesterday. Is that true? Davis. Ah, yes. That was rather unfortunate, but it does make sense. He was rather old even when he first took up the position. Now he can rest, knowing he served the church well. SCP-166 Do you know who's going to replace him? Davis Speculation has abounded, but it could be anyone. These are difficult times after all, with all the recent… controversies. They may want a fresh face to represent the church. Or, they may go with a man who's dedicated years of his life. Who knows, they may even pick a working class man. It certainly would give people something to talk about. SCP-166 I guess so. SCP-166 and Davis fall silent. Davis I'm sensing a question arising, child. SCP-166 Sorry. Davis No need to apologize. That is what I'm here for, after all. What is it? SCP-166 It's just… I wanted to ask you something, though it might be a little personal. I was just wondering, do you have a good relationship with your parents? Davis My mother, yes. Before she passed away, I visited her once a month at their retirement home, plus her birthday and holidays. Told her I was a chaplain serving in the military which I suppose is somewhat close to the truth. SCP-166 And your father? Davis That is a rather more complicated question. He was a good man, a soldier, who held three things dearly. God, country, and family. Unfortunately, he held those convictions rather severely, which resulted in some… heated discussions. I love him still, but this way is best for everyone. Davis sighs. Davis, and what about your parents? I know you lived in the convent, but before that? SCP-166 I never really knew them. I got dropped off when I was a baby. I mean, I guess they must have known the sisters if they put me there, but I don't remember them. Just what I picked up. They mentioned my mother a bit, before they realized that they should watch what they say about me. I think they said something about her being a goddess? Which obviously wouldn't be true, she must have been some sort of spirit, but she must have been something if I ended up looking like this. SCP-166 gestures to herself. SCP-166 I remember eavesdropping on the Abyss. She was talking to one of the other sisters about how she had done something wrong, 
something about a ritual that someone else stopped. They said she died. Davis, I'm sorry for your loss. SCP-166, not like I knew her. Davis, and your father. SCP-166 hesitates. SCP-166, I don't know. He must have been the one who dropped me off at the convent. But why there? Why didn't he take me with him? Davis, I'm sure he had his reasons. SCP-166, maybe. You know, they never talked about him. Not once. I must have asked the Abbess a thousand times, but she never even mentioned a hint of him. SCP-166 pauses. SCP-166, if my mother was so horrible, what did my father do? End log. Addendum 166.2. Disciplinary interview of expunged. Begin log. Light. What the hell were you thinking? Expunged. I wanted to make sure she's alright. You wouldn't let me talk to her. I took another route. Light. What you did was so much worse than that. If you just stuck to throwing your weight around to get her amenities, sure, I could overlook that. But you then go about trying to give a Class 4 anomaly a phone line to the outside world. Damn it. The Council already dislikes you working at the same site as her. This gets out, you can kiss whatever deal you made goodbye. Expunged. Come on, Sophia. She's harmless. The only reason she's in there is because of me. I had to do something. Was the Foundation just going to let her grow up thinking that her- Light. Before you say another word, remember that this will be public to everyone with a Class 4 clearance. I can redact your name, but I can't stop people from putting the pieces together from an ill-timed outburst. Expunged remains silent. Expunged. Sixteen years. Sixteen years where she couldn't walk through a city, or catch a movie, or just go shopping. Doesn't matter if she's in a convent or a foundation cell. She's being locked up for something she had no choice in. All because of me. It isn't fair. Light. I know. Expunged. And I can't do anything about it. I could send a strike team anywhere in the world. I know secrets that the most powerful people in the world would pay billions for. And yet I can't even so much as talk to her. Let her know that she's not alone. Light. You've done the best you could. Much more than anyone could have expected of you in an impossible situation. Expunged. Funny how little that makes of a difference. I... Expunged falls silent. Expunged. You know, I don't care. Just write me up. Let's just get this over with. Light. I'm scheduling you for six two-hour sessions with a Foundation psychologist. I'll make sure it's glass. He signs off at the end of it. We can expunge this from your record. I know. Thank you, Sophia. End log. On 05-08-2013, the following note was discovered within SCP-166's containment area. I first met your mother when we were little more than children. She had hooves for feet and starlight in her eyes. She was beauty and nature incarnate and I killed her with my own two hands. Eden isn't a place. It's a state of being. They wanted to take us back to it, and I stopped them. I took paradise away from us for a second time. I have never regretted my actions on that day, except one. That when you first met me on that day, you saw your father put a bullet into the head of your mother. I make no excuses, only explanation. You may not have even remembered it, but I'm telling you now in the hope you understand why I did what I did. I hope you forgive me. I love you. I wish I could have done more for you. The best I could do was leave you in the hands of kind and loving people and hope they would raise you in my place. From what I've seen, they did well. I'm sorry you couldn't stay with them. I'm sorry they've brought you to this place. I promise to do my best to make sure your stay here is pleasant. I promise to keep you safe. Happy 16th birthday. From your loving father. Item number. SCP-286. Object class. Euclid. Special containment procedures. 
SCP-286 is to be kept in a secure containment cell at Site-19. That allows an open, secure perimeter of at least 50 meter radius around SCP-286. Only D-Class personnel are permitted to have direct physical contact with SCP-286, and only as part of an approved experiment. Update 07192000 Experiments with SCP-286 are hereby suspended until further notice. 05 Surveillance cameras are to be positioned to allow 360-degree monitoring of SCP-286 during experimentation. Recordings shall be maintained and cataloged of all Sigma states exhibited by SCP-286. Update 0311 2000 As of Incident I-2865, surveillance of SCP-286 is to be continuous, and any initiation of a Sigma state is to be immediately reported to Overwatch Command. Outside the immediate project directorate, the SCP-286 Sigma State Archives and associated material are to be restricted to Level 4 access. Under no circumstances are identified instances of SCP-2861 or SCP-2862 to be prevented from having contact with SCP-286. 05 Description SCP-286 is a carved stone game board measuring 83 centimeters on a side. It bears markings consistent with the Chinese game of Lu Bo. Based on artifacts found with SCP-286 during recovery, SCP-286 has been dated to at least the Shang Dynasty, though all attempts to date the carvings directly have been inconclusive. Analysis of SCP-286's composition has shown high concentrations of iron and nickel, and crystalline microstructures consistent with if any higher-order mammal touches SCP-286, it will initiate a Sigma state. A Sigma state is indicated by the appearance of 12 tokens on the surface of the game board. The tokens appear to be constructed of the same material as SCP-286. Six tokens are dark, absorbing 75% more ambient light than the board's surface, while six tokens are light, emitting 75% more ambient light than that which actually strikes them. Appearing with the tokens on the game surface are two 18-sided dice, apparently made of bronze. As with the game tokens, a direct physical examination of the dice has proved to be impossible. The dice share the anomalous reflective and absorption properties shown by the game tokens. One light, and one dark. Otherwise, the dice appear consistent with dice found in non-anomalous Lubo sets recovered from various Chinese archaeological sites. A Sigma state will also manifest SCP-2861 and SCP-2862 to play a game. SCP-2861 and SCP-2862 are higher order mammals who have suffered temporary alterations in patterns of movement, cognition, behavior and vocalization. SCP-2861 will appear agitated, movements will become jerky and imprecise, vocalizations will be quick stuttering, and aggressive. SCP-2862 will appear sluggish, movements halting and slow, vocalizations will be low-pitched, throaty, and tend to be monosyllabic. Subjects capable of human speech will converse, but only to their opposite number during a Sigma event. Such conversations, or monologues in the case of a subject facing a non-human opponent, are conducted in a random sequence of human languages sometimes shifting multiple times within a single statement. Only 45% of the recorded conversations between SCP-2861 and SCP-2862 have been successfully translated to date. The subject who initiated the Sigma state will become an instance of SCP-2861 if they touched SCP-286 on an illuminated surface, or they will become an instance of SCP-2862 if they touched SCP-286 on a surface that is in shadow. In either case, the subject will take a seated position to one side of the board. Instances of SCP-2861 will take a position on the side nearest the light game tokens. Instances of SCP-2862 will take a position on the opposing side, nearest the dark game tokens, and roll one of the two dice manifested by SCP-286. After the die is rolled, some other higher-order mammal will appear within 47 meters of SCP-286 and become the subject's opposition 
SCP-2862 in the case where the subject is SCP-2861, or SCP-2861 the case where the subject is SCP-2862. This selection appears related to the result of the first die roll. After appearing, the subject's opposition will take a seated position facing the subject and will commence playing the first move. Gameplay then consists of SCP-2861 and SCP-2862 alternately rolling dice and moving pieces on the board in complex patterns. A game is won when the center square contains all of one side's tokens, and only that side's tokens. A winning move concludes a Sigma state. During a Sigma state, SCP-2861 and SCP-2862 will show no reaction to any external stimuli that does not physically interfere with SCP-2861, SCP-2862, and their interaction with the game. If something disrupts an ongoing game, then either SCP-2861 or SCP-2862 will stand and vocalize a statement that most commonly translates as forfeit, less commonly as draw. This event will also conclude a Sigma state. When a Sigma state concludes, players cease being designated SCP-2861 or SCP-2862, and game tokens, dice, and the subject's opposing player all vanish. All observed subjects, and those opposing players who have been identified and examined, have shown no physical after-effects from interaction with SCP-286. However, all cases have shown a marked increase in spirituality and interest in religious subjects, including, but not limited to, adoption of new belief systems, taking on of vows, speaking in tongues, and prophetic visions. For the winning player, this new spirituality will tend to take an optimistic, messianic character. For the losing player, attitudes will tend toward the apocalyptic. Addendum 1 Technical Note TN-286-55 SCP-286's possible relationship to divination and or revelation Historically, Lubo was not only a game, but also used as a method of divination the various spots on the game board corresponding to the sexagenary cycle used by Chinese to recount the passage of time since the earliest written texts. Given the propensity of subjects to have prophetic visions subsequent to their participation in a Sigma event, it has been theorized by several researchers that the moves during a Sigma event may themselves be of some prophetic significance. While the possible significance of individual moves during recorded Sigma events is ongoing and so far inconclusive, it has been determined that the act of winning does appear to correspond to significant events beyond the game itself. In particular, every instance of SCP-2861 winning has been tied to intensification of sunspots, solar flares, and generally increased solar activity. SCP-2862 winning has been associated with significant tectonic events, including because it is not known if these events were predicted by one side winning or caused by one side winning. Experimentation on SCP-286 has been suspended as an unacceptable risk. Addendum 2 Document TR-28627E Excerpted translation of dialogue between SCP-2861 and SCP-2862 during Sigma event number 27. Forward D-class test subject was a male Caucasian, 44 years of age, Identified as SCP-2861 after initiation of a Sigma state. Opposition player, SCP-2862, was an as yet unidentified Hispanic female, approximately 20 years of age. The Sigma state lasted for 68 minutes, at which time SCP-2861 achieved the winning move. During the Sigma event, the players conversed in 25 known languages and approximately 15 unknown languages. 30% of their dialogue was undecipherable, or in an indeterminate language, marking this episode the most completely translated yet recorded. Begin transcript, 1300 hours, date undisclosed. SCP-2861 You move rotate slowly imprecisely as untranslatable matter, earth, universe. SCP-2862 have possess patience, my our brother, and still quiet silence. Untranslatable, 
Mind, Thoughts, Brain. SCP-2861. Untranslatable. SCP-2862. Laughs. Distress, discomfort, displeasure. Untranslatable. To you. SCP-2861. Why would I untranslatable? Your sins, perversions, abominations. SCP-2862 laughs. SCP-2861. You disgust me. Untranslatable. Matter, Earth, Universe. Disgusts me. SCP-2862. You untranslatable in that meat skin. This amuses me. SCP-2861. Untranslatable. SCP-2862. Move, process, sequence. SCP-2861. Every time, moment, eternity. My untranslatable, closer. I must, will, shall, illuminate, enlighten. This untranslatable. SCP-2862. Size. Move, process, sequence. SCP-2861. You are too comfortable, undisturbed, enslaved, bound, chained, with an untranslatable, meat doll puppet. Do you untranslatable, love, arousal, untranslatable? SCP-2862. Move, process, sequence, or forfeit. SCP-2861. Untranslatable. SCP-2862. Untranslatable. Exiled. Banished. Me to matter. Earth. Universe. Untranslatable. No. Understand. Me more than you. SCP-2861. Untranslatable. Will no. Understand me. And be consumed. Engulfed. Destroyed. By knowledge. Understanding. SCP-2862. But, brother. I am so much closer. End transcript. 1312. Date undisclosed. Addendum 3. Incident report. I-2865. SCPs involved. SCP-286. SCP-2861. SCP-2862. SCP-4351. Date. 3-11-2000... Location, SCP-286's containment area, Site-19. Description, at 531 UTC, standard security monitoring SCP-286's containment area detected the unauthorized presence of Dr. S.S., a Foundation researcher temporarily assigned to Site-19, most recently assigned to the study of SCP-435. All experimentation on SCP-286 had been suspended for the preceding eight months, and no activity with the object had been approved. A security team was dispatched, reaching Dr. S as she entered SCP-286's containment area. Upon arrival, the security team discovered the presence of Dr. L.W., a researcher assigned to SCP-286, already seated behind the dark side of SCP-286. SCP-286 showed the signs of already being in a Sigma state. Both researchers showed behavioral anomalies, consistent with SCP-2861 and SCP-2862. Believing an unauthorized experiment was underway, the security team restrained Dr. S before she could seat herself at SCP-286. In response, Dr. L stood and vocalized what has been identified as Vulgate Latin words for Grand Forfeit. The Sigma state concluded at 5.45 UTC. Neither researcher could provide any explanation of how they were affected by SCP-286. Dr. S's last recollection was having a cup of coffee at a staff commissary on the other side of the Site-19 complex from SCP-286, while Dr. L reported that he had been reading emails in his office when he blacked out. Simultaneously, with the cessation of SCP-286's Sigma state, there was a sudden emergency in when SCP-4351 unexpectedly entered an active state, moving erratically and data expunged, impacting the ocean basin, causing a data expunged. Contingency 435XK Alpha had been initiated, but she was cancelled when SCP-4351 came to rest three minutes later. 
Note. SCP-286 classification is hereby upgraded to Euclid. 05. Item number. SCP-329. Object class. Euclid. Special containment procedures. The building in which SCP-329 is located has been purchased by a Foundation front company and designated site- Access to the site is restricted to Level 3 personnel. Facility personnel to undergo full-body scans at least every 48 hours. Since it is unknown how many adherents the Church of the Gardener possessed, site- should be considered at risk of recapture and appropriate measures taken. Description SCP-329 is a room in a derelict building at- Room is in the building's cellar, 6 meters by 5 meters, with a steel fire door. Room contains 6 folding beds. Beds are fitted with IV stands and leather restraints. 5 beds are occupied. Occupants are of both standard sexes and several races, with ages 16 through 64. Occupants have been designated SCP-3291 through SCP-3295 and have been identified as 1. No fixed address 2. No fixed address 3. Former medical student at University 4. No fixed address 5. D-Class personnel who was subjected to Event 329A Occupants of beds all have cancer Type of cancer varies from occupant to occupant, but all cases have at least three tumors of grade T3N1MO or higher. Although cancers are advanced, they do not follow normal progression. Two of the cases, with a prognosis of weeks at best under normal conditions, have remained alive since at least Occupants are alert, but in great pain, and unable to speak. Every 24 hours, at approximately 4 a.m., SCP-329 undergoes Event 329-A. The door closes with great force and cannot be reopened for the duration of the event. Anything obstructing the doorway is pulled into the room. Event 329-A lasts for approximately 20 minutes, after which it is possible to open the door again. Equipment for remote observation and recording is rendered inert during 329-A in a manner consistent with a non-standard space-time event. The only sounds heard from outside during 329-A are screaming from the room's occupants. After the event, occupants are apparently unharmed, bearing no incisions or external trauma. Their tumors, however, have been altered, in some cases radically. They have been reshaped, and their direction of growth has been altered. Three of the occupants have tumors of more than 20 feet in length, twining around and through bones and organs. SCP-3295, who was cancer-free before he was exposed to Event 329-A, was found after the event to have developed a T1-NOMO lung cancer, which in the three weeks since has grown to T3. Only people inside the room are affected by 329-A, and those who have been removed from the room, their cancer progresses normally, resulting in death. Discovery SCP-329 was discovered by a group of university medical students who noticed abnormal cancers in the bodies of indigents supplied for dissection. They traced the source to SCP-329, which was being used as a squat. They came to the Foundation's attention through material they circulated on the internet under the name of the Church of the Gardener. When a mobile task force secured SCP-329, the Church had been operating for 11 months luring indigents to the building with promises of drugs and shelter and subjecting them to Event 329-A. Seven members of the church were present and offered armed resistance. Five were eliminated by the MTF, and the other two held out long enough to subject themselves to Event 329-A. One was subsequently vivisected by the research team, and the other designated SCP-3293. The church's records were retrieved. They begin as relatively straightforward medical case notes, but degenerate over time into a religious screed. Addendum Document 3291 Partial transcript of video found at Data Expunged Your body is an Eden after the fall, ruled by the tyranny of the Great Devil in your skull. 
Your bodies are like your gray, lifeless cities. Every cell marching in lockstep. Any deviation punished. Any growth. Anything alive and green. Met with cut it out. Burn it out. Poison it. End low sung. And the budding cancer is destroyed. Or else it fights back. It brings down your body. Like Samsung does the temple of Dagon. Now it has come to cure us. Each day it plants, it prunes, and it trains. It makes the gray city a garden again, and it will take root. It will bear fruit, and it will spread across the world. Item number, SCP-336. Object class, Euclid. Special containment procedures. SCP-336 is to be provided living quarters 6 meters by 6 meters in size, maintained regularly. This maintenance, as well as all other tasks requiring direct contact with SCP-336, are to be carried out exclusively by female personnel. SCP-336 may make requests for furnishings or items. However, approval of these requests is contingent on SCP-336's cooperation with personnel and subject to the project's head researcher's approval. Requests for access to anomalous or dangerous items are to be denied. A voice modulator device fitted over SCP-336's mouth is to be checked and maintained by Level 0 personnel weekly. The modulator may be unlocked with a six-digit combination provided to personnel Level 2 and higher for the purpose of testing SCP-336. In the event of the device's failure or unintended deactivation, Local lockdown procedures are to be respected until SCP-336 has been isolated. Description SCP-336 appears to be a pale-skinned human female, of otherwise Arabic or Middle Eastern descent, in its late twenties. SCP-336 is 1.73 meters, or 5 foot 8 inches in height, and weighs 68 kilograms, or 150 pounds, as of its last physical. Subject requires no sleep or sustenance, and does not appear to be affected by aging or sickness of any nature. The object is anatomically human, with the exception of dermal irregularities along the thighs and calves, which appear structurally similar to reptilian scales. SCP-336 behaves impassively and detached with regards to human beings, and demonstrates highly introverted behavior. The subject is highly intelligent and analytical having scored in the 95th percentile or above in most intelligence tests. A noticeable improvement in attitude is observed when SCP-336 uses a mirror, as the subject has been noted to be highly narcissistic, and has a tendency to spend long periods of time admiring its reflection. Human subjects directly exposed to the unobstructed vocalizations of SCP-336 experience one of two effects, depending on the presence of a Y chromosome in the subject's genome. Subjects lacking a Y chromosome and possessing otherwise healthy reproductive systems will experience inexplicable infertility. The duration of this infertility varies, but is directly proportional to the length of exposure. Subjects with a Y chromosome experience a separate anomaly that presents itself after two to three hours of exposure to SCP-336's voice. During an affected subject's next regular sleep cycle, he will instead enter a coma, six to eight hours in duration in place of normal rest. Over the course of this coma, approximately 100 grams of non-essential tissue, typically from the subject's rib cage, will separate from the subject seamlessly and inexplicably increase in mass, transforming into a full-grown instance of SCP-3361 before the subject awakens. Instances of SCP-3361 are various adult female organisms formed from disparate anatomical elements, selected seemingly at random from two or more genetically unrelated vertebrates. 90% of instances incorporate elements from two or more of the following species. Homo sapiens, Aquila fasciata, Benelli's eagle, Vipera amidites, sand viper, Panthera leopersica, Asiatic lion, Bos primigenius, Aurochs, extinct, Echospherus perzewalski, Mongolian wild horse, and an unidentified subspecies of Capra aegigrus, wild goat. 
Current findings suggest that the genetic makeup of the affected subject directly correlates with the composition of the corresponding instance. Research is ongoing. The majority of these hybrids are not anatomically viable and typically expire within two weeks. Surviving instances are irrationally violent and demonstrate no evidence of higher intelligence. SCP-336 has demonstrated mild disdain for instances of SCP-3361 and has been reluctant to discuss both the organisms and the means of their creation. As SCP-336 has been otherwise cooperative with Foundation personnel, the reason for this behavior is unknown. Addendum 3361 Recent experimentation has identified an irregularity in the object's effects on subjects whose Y chromosomes exhibit the Cohen modal haplotype. Instances of SCP-3361 formed from such subjects are exclusively Homo sapiens, with no hybridized anatomy. Additionally, these instances demonstrate intelligence and limited innate knowledge, including fluent speech in the subject's native language. Two of these instances have been retained for long-term study. Item Number SCP-360 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures Foundation agents embedded in airport security and Sky Marshal agencies worldwide are to monitor air travelers and chartered flights for suspected activity related to SCP-360. Individuals suspected of attempting SCP-360 are to be detained, questioned, and administered a Class A amnestic. All items related to the activation of SCP-360 are to be confiscated for research. In confirmed cases of SCP-360 activation, Foundation response teams are to enact media suppression and prevent dissemination of knowledge pertaining to the incident. Flight crew and passenger witnesses are to be administered a Class B amnestic and given a cover story. Description: SCP-360 is an anomalous ritual that ostensibly allows a single living human subject to ascend to a higher plane of existence. When performed at an altitude of 10,500 meters or higher, affected subjects emit a blinding light and a burst of high-energy radiation for several seconds, then disappear. The radiation dosage is negligible and does not pose any long-term danger to affected individuals. However, due to the altitude required for successful activation, SCP-360 has resulted in numerous aviation incidents involving both public and private aircraft. When questioned, numerous witnesses of SCP-360 activation events, particularly those identifying as devout religious adherents, have reportedly experienced auditory and or visual hallucinations, consistent with their religious beliefs. These have taken the form of seeing the affected subject with luminescent wings or a halo prior to disappearance, music with no identifiable source, religious iconography or imagery, or a feeling that they were in the vicinity of a powerful presence. To date, no individual who has successfully performed SCP-360 has ever been recovered. Addendum 361 Investigation Log Following thorough interrogation of individuals detained prior to a successful activation of SCP-360, it has been determined that in every case, knowledge of SCP-360 has been disseminated through a multi-page letter sent to the individual's residence. This letter reportedly contains self-help information, instructions for performing SCP-360, as well as a final message encouraging the reader to forward the contents onto other interested individuals. The vast majority of interrogated individuals had already forwarded the letter, but on one instance was successfully contained by members of Mobile Task Force Alpha 4, Pony Express, prior to mail pickup by local postal employees. The contents of the handwritten letter, which have been determined to be non-anomalous, are as follows. To whom it may concern, faith is real, but devotion is a myth. God exists. In fact, all gods exist. They are real, and their power is real, but their motivations are childish and petulant. Whether you believe in salvation, transcendence, or reincarnation, 
These are but hoops in the petty games that they would have you believe to be necessary. Real peace is found within you, and no priest or rabbi can tell you otherwise. When you learn to accept and love yourself, that's when the world finally falls into place and the truth becomes clear. Let go of the empty words pretending to guide you to true happiness. Let the world fade away around you and embrace the power within yourself. From those who have gone before to those who are about to come, we are here, waiting. Not as gods or angels, but as brothers and sisters. The remainder of the document describes two items required for successful activation of SCP-360, as well as the procedure required to complete the ritual. You will need a token, something from a loved one, a gift from a child, a flower from a spouse, or a toy from a parent. Something that means something to you. You will need to mix a potion. The ingredients are simple, but need to be precise. 50 milliliters of purified water, one crushed mint leaf, five grams of dried willow bark, three milliliters of tea tree oil, 500 milligrams of acetaminophen, Combine ingredients and simmer over low heat until it turns luminous gold. 1. Fly. Lift yourself above the highest peaks, where the air is thin and the heavens are close. Angels and demons may be the messengers of the usurpers, but they have wings for a reason. 2. Hold your token close to your heart. Remember how you felt when it was given. Cherish that feeling and let it grow within you. 3. Drink the potion. Let it numb the body and free your spirit. 4. Repeat these words. 5. Be free. Pass this on to those who need it. You know who they are, and you always wish that there was more you could do to help. They will find you and thank you for it. That's a promise. Due to the continued occurrence of incidents confirmed or suspected to be related to SCP-360, it is suspected that additional instances of this documentation remain uncontained. MTF Alpha 4 is continuing to monitor postal services for instances and contain them as they become identified. Item Number SCP-361 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-361 is to be kept in a standard artifact containment unit in Site-19's High Value Wing. SCP-361 is to be kept in a cool and dry environment to prevent damage to the aged metal it is composed of and thoroughly cleaned after each use. Description: SCP-361 is a bronze Etruscan artifact in the shape of a sheep's liver. SCP-361 is covered in the names of Etruscan gods and instructions for various religious rites, and is believed to have served as a tool for practicing haruspicy, divination using animal organs. SCP-361 bears a strong resemblance to the non-anomalous artifact known as the liver of Piacenza, with which it was originally found during the late 19th century. Both artifacts date to the 2nd and 3rd century BCE to the province of Piacenza, Italy. SCP-361's anomalous properties manifest if it comes into contact with the sheep's liver, removed no more than three hours before interacting with SCP-361. When such contact is made, SCP-361 will vocalize, in a language and tone appropriate to the one introducing the liver to it, a set of instructions meant to achieve contact with one of the gods or spirits depicted in the writings covering it through a service it refers to as Harusko. If these instructions are performed correctly within a period of 30 seconds, SCP-361 will provide a new set of instructions. SCP-361's instructions will grow increasingly convoluted and or nonsensical until becoming almost impossible to perform under the given time limit. Failure to follow an instruction will cause SCP-361 to become inactive for a period of 24 hours. Test Log SCP-361 Test 361A Stage 1 
A sheep's liver is introduced to SCP-361. Vocalization Welcome to Harris Co. Your sacrifice is very important to us. For Tinia the Thunderer, please perform a horizontal incision on the offering. For Ida of the Underworld, please perform a vertical incision. For Maris, lightly cover your offering with the ash of a dead warrior related to you by blood. Stage 2 a horizontal incision is made. Vocalization. You have selected Tinia. For your weekly meteorological divination, please singe your offering over an open flame for five seconds. For warning bolts, please place a green olive on the altar. For beseechments and beneficial interventions, please attach a written consent from the consulate gods. For catastrophes, please remove the head of an adult ox and hold. Stage 3. The liver is singed over an open flame. Vocalization. You have selected weekly meteorological divination. For your local forecast, please perform the seven sacred rites of Tinia while avoiding the anger of the mildew spirits. For forecasts for other areas, please perform the rites upon a boat of three masts or more. For a marital forecast, please consult with your local priestess of Uni. Stage 4. Researchers were unable to comply with the instructions in the given time frame. Vocalization. No input was received. This sacrifice will be disconnected. Thank you for using Horace Co., Rosna's number one divination and deistic petition service for more than 2,000 years. The gods are looking forward to your next call. SCP-361 enters an active state. Addendum. SCP-361-A. In order to examine the limits of SCP-361's ability to alter the language and tone it uses to interact with its user, a subject with a similar cultural origin to SCP-361 was required. For that purpose, a request for interaction between SCP-361 and SCP-1510, the persona of which originates from the same general area and time period, was made and accepted. Test. 361B. Stage 1. Subject D1510104, wearing SCP-1510, introduces a sheep's liver to SCP-361. Vocalization. SCP-361 vocalizes in classical Latin, the language spoken by SCP-15101. The instruction is translated to Son of Romulus. Speak the words thy father taught you, and your watcher will speak, his words carried by our spirit. Stage 2 SCP-15101 chants several phrases in Latin, later identified as an oath to Mars Gradivus. Vocalization SCP-361's instruction is translated to Place the aspect of your watcher at his feet, so he might see your altered form. Stage 3 SCP-15101 requests an open flame. He is given a camping gas lamp. SCP-1510 places the lit gas lamp at the feet of the table SCP-361 is placed on. Vocalization. SCP-361's instruction is translated to Speak the duty of your watcher, so he might judge your worthiness. Stage 4. SCP-15101 speaks a Latin phrase, later identified as Mars Gradivus' oath, to guard, preserve, and protect the state, the peace, and the senate. Vocalization. SCP-361's instruction is translated to, show your watcher that you do not stand alone. Does he who guards your left carry with him your watcher's conviction? Stage 5. SCP-15101 requests one of the supervising researchers to enter the room and touch SCP-361. Request granted. Vocalization. SCP-361 speaks in a different voice, still in classical Latin. Courage, Publius. This too shall pass. When Rust claims your soul at last, Valor will make you into Aeneas and carry you beyond these shores to rest among your fathers. The voice was later identified by SCP-15101 as the voice of the Persona's father. SCP-361 enters an active state.
Item number, SCP-370. Object class, Keter. Warning, SCP-370 is an exceedingly contagious memetic infection. No cases of personnel being infected simply from reading this article have yet been recorded. But nevertheless, as a precaution, this document may only be read in a controlled environment, with mechanisms in place to terminate the reader at the first symptoms. Spreading any information about SCP-370 by word of mouth is grounds for immediate termination. Special Containment Procedures SCP-370 itself is embedded in a small slab of solid lead and kept inside a solid steel box with no openings and 0.5 meter thick walls. Under no circumstances is SCP-370 to be removed from either this box or the lead slab. If SCP-370 becomes partially or completely exposed, blindfolded personnel will be assigned to locate it with a metal detector. An electromagnet will then be used to transfer SCP-370 to a small mold filled with molten lead. Once this is hardened, the lead slab containing SCP-370 will be returned to its steel box, and the box returned to its containment vault. This box is kept in a specially designed vault at site SCP-370 requires no maintenance whatsoever, and no research is authorized. Desire to open this vault to perform research on SCP-370, or for any other reason, is a symptom of SCP-370 infection. Any personnel displaying this or any other symptoms must be quarantined immediately and terminated if symptoms persist. SCP-370's vulnerability status is unknown. No testing of this sort has been carried out, and no future testing is authorized, due to the extreme risk of contagion to personnel involved. D-Class personnel with significant violent or sadistic tendencies are to be preferred in all interactions with SCP-370, or potentially SCP-370 contagious data. All live broadcasting capability will be removed from any Foundation site that shows signs of SCP-370 presence and restored one year after the last SCP-370 event. Any personnel assigned to SCP-370 who show a sudden improvement in overall well-being should be quarantined and deprived of sleep. If any personnel continue to display happiness symptoms, despite this measure, termination will be authorized. Description SCP-370 is a key. The size Shape, material, and general appearance of SCP-370 are unknown. Knowledge of these characteristics is the primary vector for the spread of the SCP-370 disease. Therefore, all records thought to contain such information have been destroyed without review. The disease caused by SCP-370 has three distinct sets of symptoms. Designations SCP-370-A, B, and C. The form of the disease appearing in any given subject appears to be determined primarily by personality. SCP-370-A manifests most frequently in subjects characterized by their peers as self-centered or cowardly. It is the most common manifestation. Subjects suffering from SCP-370-A show no symptoms upon the initial infection. However, these subjects will commit suicide as soon as they have an opportunity to do so with minimal suffering. For example, SCP-370-A victims will jump from high ledges or shoot themselves in the head with firearms, but will not cut their own wrists or hang themselves. The instant the subject's heart ceases to beat, the infected corpse will glow brilliantly and undergo an unknown transformation. Detailed knowledge of the transformation is a vector for the infection, as is direct visual contact with the light produced. No trace of any part of a subject's corpse has ever been recovered following this transformation. The majority of SCP-370-B subjects are commonly described as both extroverted and altruistic. However, an identical manifestation of SCP-370-B appears in individuals with strong sadistic or violent tendencies. Subjects infected with SCP-370-B initially become very calm. This stage lasts for several seconds and is followed by a sudden unprovoked assault on anyone within the subject's reach, which continues into an indiscriminate killing spree. 
Persons killed by the infected subject will glow brightly and undergo an unknown transformation, presumably the same or similar to that of the suicides. Initially, the infected subject is no more dangerous than any ordinary violent human. However, after approximately killing two to three victims, the subject's body will begin to radiate yellow light. This light appears to inhibit the sympathetic nervous response of the subject's victims, making it difficult for victims to fight back. After approximately five to six successful kills, the light triples in intensity, and the direct skin-to-skin -skin contact with the subject becomes deadly. At this point, any eye contact with the victim becomes a contagious factor. After killing an average of 12 victims, subjects who were considered violent prior to infection may require as many as 50 kills to reach this stage. The subject will abruptly cease hostilities and enter the final phase of SCP-370-B infection. Subjects will raise its arms skyward and shout in a slightly amplified voice, Take me home. This sound seems to pass through soundproof walls and industrial strength earmuffs with only slight muffling. Infection of all human beings within earshot is virtually guaranteed, except in case of sensory deafness. After this cry, a shaft of radiation in the visible spectrum forms around the subject, who will then levitate several feet above the ground before and vanishing. As with SCP-370-A, no traces of the vanished subjects have ever been found. SCP-370-C manifests in subjects of high IQ and analytical or contemplative personality type, and is the most dangerous of the three manifestations. Unfortunately, the majority of the Foundation's research staff are susceptible to SCP-370-C. Upon initial infection, subjects will close their eyes and remain voluntarily still and silent for an average of 30 seconds. If questioned on this, subjects will claim to have been praying. Any infected subjects detected at this stage must be terminated immediately and by any means necessary. After the initial infection, subjects will behave as normal, but with significant increase in sense of well-being. This system persists even when the subject is forced into unpleasant conditions. Infected subjects seem to possess SCP-370 contagious knowledge about the appearance and exact nature of SCP-370, whether or not they have ever been exposed to such information. Subjects will actively and covertly attempt to spread SCP-370 infection, specifically targeting victims likely to manifest SCP-370-A or SCP-370-C. These efforts are likely to include, but not limited to, mentioning SCP-370 contagious information in casual conversation, attempting to have SCP-370 removed from containment for research or attempted disposal, adding SCP-370 vectors to Foundation research notes or other documents, including this page, attempting to broadcast infectious material on a large scale, after about 50 successful infections, SCP-370-C enters its final phase. During this phase, the air around the subject radiates a small amount of light in the visible spectrum, creating a faint yellow glow around the subject. This glow induces a parasympathetic calming response in viewers and has a percent chance of causing infection for every minute of visual contact. Within about a day of this radiation appearing, Regardless of any further successful infections, a flaming data expunged, burn marks on any surfaces it touches or passes through, and leaving no trace of the infected subject. This event leaves behind an invisible patch of contagious space, which infects anyone who passes through it. Patches seem to fade in approximately seven days, but as a precaution, should be avoided for a full two weeks. It has become apparent that SCP-370-C infection is being used by some personnel as an excuse to torment and murder fellow Foundation staff. The personnel responsible have been demoted to D-Class. However, considering the enormous threat posed by SCP-370-C, the containment protocol above will not be revised. Dr. Addendum 370-A the circumstances of SCP-370's original retrieval are unknown. 
It was found in the ruins of Site, a remote foundation base in eastern. These containment protocols in their original form and the described steel box were found in a sealed vault along with a single corpse identified as Dr. A known Satanist and the doctor's personal log, which was found to be SCP-370 contagious. The rest of the site was abandoned and no other dead bodies were found, although signs of struggle were ubiquitous. The rest of the site's stored data on SCP-370 had been erased or destroyed, although a few useful notes on other SCPs were recovered, particularly SCP- Several infection events occurred during recovery efforts. These were contained with extreme prejudice, and the infection was believed extinct. SCP-370 was briefly designated safe. However, in light of recent data expunged, Keter designation has been restored, and anti-memetic security has been tightened throughout all Foundation sites. Addendum 370B Dr. Rand's log has been successfully purged of memetic infectiousness and is cleared for viewing by authorized personnel. The same precautions described for reading this article also apply to the log. Incident 370A Personal Log of Dr. Date Data Absent 2009 Richard's team came back yesterday. What was left of it anyway? Most of them were wiped out by some sort of memetic infection. They've also brought back an artifact, a key or something, from the dig. There's something wrong with Richard. He ought to be inconsolable, having lost so many agents, but he just keeps smiling. Meanwhile, work on SCP has ground to a depressing halt. The next battery of tests will involve irrelevant data expunged. Personal log of Dr. Date. Data absent. 2009. Ha! I was right. I knew there was something abnormal about those smiles. They brought the artifact out today. Half the people who saw the damn thing just started attacking everyone in sight and had to be put down. The survivors have been quarantined. The bodies of the dead have been incinerated and the survivors are still in quarantine. The artifact recovered has been designated SCP-370. I hate observational memetic hazards, by the way. How am I supposed to study something if I can't f***ing look at it? Personal log of Dr. Date Data absent 2009 It's not observational. It's worse. Probably the worst meme we've ever encountered. Reading the notes on the thing seemed to have exactly the same effect as looking at it. It's pure luck I didn't get infected myself. Word of mouth information transfer does the same thing. We've got a full third of our research staff in quarantine now. Or at least we should. Some of them have just disappeared. I'm freaking out here. I did a compassion ritual yesterday. Made me feel a bit better. Details of ritual expunged. Seeing Richard in this state is really messing with my head. He's not himself at all. He's freakishly cheerful, borderline manic, and he's tried to breach the quarantine three times already. Managed to cause several infections by shouting what I assume were details about SCP-370's appearance. I don't even know what information can spread this thing. I personally destroyed a bunch of documents without review earlier today, and had anyone who protested quarantined. Dr. C says I'm being paranoid, so I quarantined him too. Personal log of Dr. Date Data absent 2009 Well, I've solved the mystery of the disappearing personnel. Some of the infected commit suicide, and when they do, they vanish with this blinding flash. I caught maybe the very edge of the flash. I'm afraid I'm contaminated now. I can feel the key hovering around the edges of my mind. If I wanted to, I think I could see it in my head. Ugh. I've started a write-up of the containment procedure, for if we ever contain the thing, helps me keep my mind off, well, it. There are three kinds of infections. The murdering kind, the suicidal kind, and the happy kind. Suicides and murderers don't actively try to spread the infection, 
but deaths caused by 370 all seemed to create this infectious light. The happy ones seemed mentally unaffected, but their only desire is to spread this thing by any means necessary. They're clever, though. They'll pretend not to be affected. The only giveaway is the happiness. Even if you torture them, they show signs of pain but don't seem to care. It doesn't make them unhappy. On the bright side, I had to have a talk with Dr. C via a Class D go-between, and he told me to go f myself, so I've let him go. Personal Log of Dr. Date Data Absent 2009 We've lost our grip on this thing. Richard and team are still contained, but we have the Smilers wandering free in the base. I've taken to carrying a handgun and just shooting anyone who looks happy. Considering how haggard and miserable most of our staff is, there's not much chance of a false positive. I've sabotaged all the communication systems. We will stop this thing here. The infection in me feels like it's spreading, starting to take a conscious effort not to think about that. There is no God. I am God. Personal log of Dr. Date. Data absent. 2009. There is no God. Quarantine had been breached. I'm afraid Dr. C and I may be the only uninfected personnel on site at this point. He's only safe because he was in that quarantine cell for so long. Knowledge is starting to slip. I know things. Expunged. Not know what 370 looks like, but I know expunged. There is no gate. I worship only myself. Personal log of Dr. Date. Data absent. 2009. Notes. From this point on, the writing gets more and more shaky. Some parts appear illegible, and large segments had to be removed due to mimetic contamination. Satan used to be just a symbol to me, a symbol of my own unrepressed desires, a symbol of freedom. I've changed my mind. I pledged expunged. I've performed another ritual, not in the book, just one that came to me. I had to use Dr. C. Felt a bit bad about that at first, but it's all for the foundation. I have a plan. Expunged. Until all the infected have expunged. Should provide an opening for me to make contact expunged. If I can get the physical key encased within the molten lead for my experiment with SCP, then expunged until the rest of the Foundation finds us. I think I'll stick it in a huge steel box, too. You know, just in case. Personal Log of Dr. Date Data Absent 2009 Notes This final entry is written in blood and begins with an outline of a complex and gruesome ritual involving, among other things, the use of 80% of the Invoker's blood. Intended purpose of this ritual is unknown, and our attempts to recreate it have all failed, with the subjects falling dead from blood loss before completing the procedure. Details of ritual expunged. In the name of adversary I, seal the gates. Expunged. Return to your thrones. Personal log of Dr. Date. Data absent, 2009. Notes. Again, written in blood. Positively identified as Dr. What have I done? My memory is shaky. Not surprising considering what I've been doing to my mind for the past few days. The containment must have been successful, as I find myself sealed in with 370 in this book. Good. The effects of the ritual are beginning to wear off. Feeling extremely woozy. Consciousness fading. What have I done? Ultimate selfishness or ultimate sacrifice? Or just ultimate pettiness and spite? I must apologize to Richard. End of log. Lesson complete. To continue with your orientation training, Subscribe to SCP Orientation right now and make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos.